Hi, this is Elise from the future, popping in to let you know that today you're going to see Elise talk about true crime. I post a weekly series called Cleaning and Crime, where every week I post a motivating cleaning video, while at the same time I'm telling you a true crime story. But this video is the bonus crime-only video version of today's story for those of you that find the cleaning too distracting. If you are looking for the original video with the cleaning, follow the link in the description box or push this thingy above my head. But if you're only here for the crime, you're in the right place. Enjoy. We've spent months talking about true crime over here on Cleaning and Crime, and I have yet to talk about a murderous child. I love scary movies in addition to true crime, and scary movies with like a haunted or creepy child nightmare fuel. So today I'm going to tell you about a real life creepy child, an 11 year old convicted murderer, Mary Bell. And this case is a super interesting example of the nature versus nurture argument. So keep that in the back of your mind while you're listening to today's story. Mary Flora Bell was born in Newcastle, England on May 26th, 1957 to her mother, Elizabeth McCricket, who went by Betty. Betty was 17 years old at the time of having Mary. And the moment Mary was handed to Betty, Betty reportedly told the nurses, take that thing away from me. Betty was a teenage sex worker, and it's still unknown who Mary's biological father was. But about a year after Mary was born, Betty married a man named Billy Bell, and he served as Mary's father figure as she grew up. Not a great father figure, though. He was an alcoholic, and he had a history of armed robbery under his belt. He was a career criminal, and he was in and out of prison for the majority of Mary's childhood. So we're off to a great start. The family lived together in Scottswood, and I'm not familiar with how Scottswood is now, but this area grew rapidly during the Industrial Revolution. Around the 1950s, however, industries were dying. Unemployment was rising, and it was becoming a very deprived area. So in the late 50s, early 60s, while Mary was growing up there, Scottswood, had the highest crime rate in Britain, as well as the highest rates of alcoholism. The Bells lived at 70 White House Road, and the houses were very run down and dirty. The Newcastle Council was flagging structures for demolition to make room for new homes, despite the fact that families were currently inhabiting them. There was a constant police presence because of drug use and sex work and criminal activity. But despite all this, the children of the neighborhood ran outside every morning to go out and play unsupervised from the age of two and up. And they would play outside till all hours of the night. They would just acquire random jam sandwiches from whatever mom they could find at any random house if they got hungry. So a little different than we're used to now where we don't let our kids out of our sight. Mary's mother, Betty, was a well-known sex worker in the area. She would either travel to Glasgow for work or she would entertain clients in her home. Betty specialized in sadomasochism and whipping and asphyxiation. So choking for enhanced pleasure. She also struggled with alcoholism and bipolar disorder. Apparently, Betty started introducing Mary as a service to her clients, starting at the age of four. So Betty was passing her daughter Mary around to her nasty-ass clients so that they could abuse her. It's just awful. And she told Mary that Mary couldn't tell anyone and that nobody would believe her anyway. And then when Mary was done being abused... Betty would reward her with sweets and also would show her lots of love and affection as a reward. Mary would later report that those moments were the only times in her life that she ever felt loved. Seriously, fuck Betty. Mary was a chronic bedwetter as a child. Gee, I wonder why. Mary was frightened to go to bed at night for fear that she would wet the bed because if she did, her mother would rub her face in it and then lift the mattress up and put it on display for the neighbors to see. Some believe that Betty suffered from Munchausen syndrome by proxy because there were several instances where Mary was hospitalized because she consumed a large amount of pills. Once when Mary was one, she accidentally swallowed a whole bunch of pills and had to be hospitalized. And those pills were Mary Mary's mother's headache medications, and they were tucked away, hidden, where Mary couldn't find them or reach them, and she would have been unable to open them on her own as a one-year-old. Another time, Mary had to have her stomach pumped, and Betty told the doctors that Mary had gone into her purse and stolen the pills and taken them herself. And another time, Mary had to be hospitalized for three months because Betty had given her a bunch of iron pills and told Mary that they were candy. There was also an instance of Mary falling out of a window, many alleging that Betty was the one that threw her out. Yikes. 
Betty would dump Mary off with friends and family and whoever she could when she just couldn't deal with Mary anymore. And one time Betty even gave Mary away to a complete stranger. So Betty walked into an adoption agency with Mary, presumably to give Mary up for adoption because she was done with her. And as Betty and Mary are walking into this adoption agency, there was a woman walking out of an interview room and she was crying. And she had said that she was just denied and was not able to adopt a baby. So Betty tells this stranger, here, take this one. I don't want her. I was going to put her up for adoption anyway. And she just gave Mary to this lady. And the lady's like, great, and took Mary home. But Betty's sister, Catherine, had followed them to the adoption agency because she was suspicious that something weird was going on. And she was right. And she saw Mary leaving with this strange woman. So Betty's sister, Mary's aunt, followed them to the new house. So she was able to go to the house, talk to the woman, and get Mary back. It's insane. And it's crazy to think that, God, maybe if Mary would have just gone to live with that strange woman, maybe she would have just had a completely normal life. Now, I mentioned Aunt Catherine. Catherine and her husband watched Mary often. Betty would drop her off frequently, and they loved having her around, and they watched Mary quite a bit for the first six years or so of her life. Catherine loved watching Mary, and she never really wanted to send her back to Betty's house because she suspected abuse. And it seemed like Betty didn't want Mary around anyway. And Catherine would straight up offer to keep Mary. Like, hey, just let her live here, or I'll adopt her if you want. But Betty would always come back and get Mary and would never allow Catherine to keep her. It was like she didn't want the girl, but she also didn't want to give her up either. And it was after the final hospitalization with the iron pill overdose that Catherine confronted Betty for the final time. Catherine accused Betty of abusing Mary and asked if she could just keep her, which sparked a gigantic fight so big that Betty ended up cutting off her entire family completely. Now, the accidents and the overdoses stopped at this point. But Mary's life certainly didn't get any better. Mary had a difficult time making friends as a child. She had trouble getting along with other kids. She was described as cold and detached. When she was four years old, she did manage to make friends with a five-year-old girl who lived on her street. But that little girl was hit by a bus right in front of Mary. Remember how all the kids just like played outside like unsupervised? So Mary watched her only friend get hit by a bus and die when she was four. Can you imagine how? (sighs) By the time Mary was eight years old, she began charging strange men to have her watch them pleasure themselves in their cars. So she would just like hop into strange guys' cars, tell them what to do, and then she would threaten them and blackmail them until they gave her money. Eight years old. At school, Mary was described as a compulsive liar. She acted out a lot, and she was a troublemaker, and she had an explosive temper and violent outbursts. The other kids were straight up scared to play with her because sometimes she would seem completely normal, and then she would just snap and attack the other kids. She would hit, kick, grab other kids by the throat. By the time Mary was 10, the other kids knew her mannerisms, and they knew if Mary's head started shaking and her eyes went cold and icy, run. In 1968, Mary made friends with a little girl named Norma Bell who lived next door. They did have the same last name, but they were not related. Mary Bell and Norma Bell were always together, inseparable. Norma was two years older than Mary, but Mary was definitely the leader of the two. Whatever Mary did or wherever she went, Norma would follow. Mary was described as the smarter of the two, and Norma was a bit behind academically. And Norma was also described in all the articles I read as being simple. She was described as easily led, easily manipulated, easily taken advantage of. And she also looked and acted younger than she was. When they met, Mary was 10 and Norma was 12. Norma and Mary were very mischievous together and they caused all kinds of trouble all over the neighborhood. But they also encouraged each other and they pushed each other to cause more and more trouble. So basically they were a bad influence on each other. And they pretty quickly escalated to petty crimes. Mary and Norma were arrested when they were 10 and 12 for stealing money from a gas meter. Now, I had to look this up because I was like, how do you steal money from a gas meter? But I guess in this area at this time, they had coin-operated gas meters. And the detective that questioned Mary when he arrested the girls was very surprised at how well-spoken and streetwise she was. Like, he would ask her a question and she would just say, no comment. And she was 10 years old. 
So Mary and Norma were charged with theft and they pled guilty and they were released to their parents because this was their first offense and they were children. Afterward, the mothers were talking to the detective that arrested the girls and Mary's mother, Betty, was screaming at him, crying, yelling, how could you take these sweet, innocent girls to court? And he told them, if you two ladies don't start supervising these girls and paying more attention, they're going to be in a lot more trouble than stealing money from a gas meter pretty quickly. And he was right. On May 11th, 1968, Mary and Norma found a three-year-old boy, John Best, playing outside. And little John was actually Mary's cousin. And the girls convinced him to come with them to the sweet shop and buy some treats. Not even an hour later, the girls brought the little boy to the Delaville Arms pub asking for help. And the boy was bleeding from his head. John was crying and the girls told the guys in the pub that they found him wandering around in the streets crying and bleeding. And they thought maybe he'd fallen. Police and ambulances are called and John tells them that the three of them, Mary, Norma, and John, were playing on an old unused air raid shelter and that he thought one of the girls had pushed him, causing him to fall seven feet to the ground where he cut his head. Now, John did make a full recovery, which is great. Now, word got around to the neighborhood parents that Norma and Mary were with the little boy when he got hurt. And that evening, the parents of three young girls went to police to report that Mary had tried to strangle their daughters while they played on a playground in a sand pit. These girls were seven-year-old Pauline and six-year-olds Susan and Cindy. So the cops bring Mary and Norma in for questioning. Now, both girls said nobody pushed John, but he did fall off the ledge and get hurt, so they took him to go get help. Mary did much later admit that it was her who pushed John off the ledge. But at the time, Mary denied everything to the police, including any strangling attempts. But when Norma was questioned separately, she admitted that Mary had tried to throttle the girls. Apparently, Mary had gone up to seven-year-old Pauline on the playground, unprovoked, pushed her down into the sandbox, and started choking her with one hand, while with the other hand grabbing sand and stuffing it in her mouth. And Norma even got a little bit spooked by this because she jumped up and started asking Mary to stop. Mary was just distracted enough to look up and that gave Pauline a chance to break free and just start running back home. Like, screw this, I'm out of here. Then Mary got up and walked over to six-year-old Susan and started strangling her with both hands until the poor girl turned purple. Then Mary just randomly lets go and walks over to six-year-old Cindy and says, What happens when you choke someone? Do you die? and then wrapped her hands around Cindy's throat. And she strangled Cindy until she turned purple as well and just let go and left. The marks on Pauline's neck from Mary's attack didn't go away for three days. Again, Mary was 10 years old, but nothing was done about any of these incidents because the girls were so young. The police just thought if we sit these girls down and give them a talking to, that'll get through to them, that'll be enough. It was different times. Then two weeks later, on May 25th, 1968, four-year-old Martin Brown woke up in Scottswood and snuck downstairs to go get himself some milk and cookies before his family woke up. It was Saturday, so his family was sleeping in. So he got some cookies, brought a couple up to his sister who he shared a room with, and they enjoyed some cookies before breakfast. Very independent little four-year-old. Around 9 a.m., Martin woke up his parents, Georgie and June, so they could have breakfast together, and then out he went to go play. Around 3 p.m., Martin stopped over at his aunt's house to ask for some money so he can go to the store and buy a lollipop. Martin was seen buying his lollipop at 315. Nearby, there was an area where a bunch of buildings were being demolished. But the city was just knocking them down and then not cleaning up any of the rubble. So there was just a mixture of rubble, dilapidated buildings, partially demolished buildings, and no adults anywhere. So naturally, kids gravitated toward that spot to go climb and do dangerous shit. At 3.30 p.m., a group of three local boys were being dangerous and playing on rubble and collecting scrap wood. And they walked into one of the abandoned buildings. They walked up the stairs to the second floor and they found little four-year-old Martin Brown laying on the ground on his back with his arms outstretched above his head, not moving. And there was blood, saliva, and foam coming from the boy's mouth. But other than that, there were no signs of violence or injury to the boy. Now, the three boys started screaming for help, and there was a local workman nearby named John Hall. He heard the screams and came running. As soon as he found Martin, he realized Martin was not breathing, started administering CPR to help. Just then, 
Who comes running in the doorway to see what's going on but Mary and Norma? The girls were quickly shooed away and they ran off to go find an adult. So they ran to Rita Finlay's house, who was Martin Brown's aunt. And Mary and Norma knocked on her door. And when she answered, Mary said, one of your sister's bairns has had an accident. We think it's Martin, but we can't tell because there's blood all over him. (laughs) I'm sure that was jarring. What a way to deliver that news. Unfortunately, it was too late, and Martin Brown was already dead before John Hall even started administering CPR. The post-mortem exam was not able to establish a cause of death, but there was an aspirin bottle laying next to the boy. So the investigator theorized that Martin had swallowed the bottle of pills, and this was just a tragic accident. Scottswood residents were outraged because the ruins from the demolished buildings were never cleaned up. And everyone blamed the dangerous environment for why Martin had died. So everyone got together and protested, marched in the streets with signs, and begged the city to clean up the safety hazards. And it was just great fun for Mary and Norma. They were singing and laughing and dancing at the front of all the marches. The next day, May 26th, was Mary's 11th birthday, and Mary and Norma decided to celebrate by playing at Norma's house for the day. And while they were playing, Norma's dad actually walked in on Mary strangling Norma's little sister. He obviously ran in and broke it up, but he didn't really do anything else about it. Like, he kind of didn't think it was as serious as it was. He thought they were just playing rough and didn't know any better, so he scolded them and then just, that was it. Then to finish celebrating Mary's birthday, Mary and Norma decided to vandalize the local nursery in town. So they busted into Woodland Crescent, the nursery, by peeling off the slate tiles off of the roof and sneaking in. They didn't take anything, but they just like wrecked the place. They tore books, they flipped desks, they smeared ink and paint all over the walls, and then they left a series of notes behind, and then they left. Then the next day, on Monday, the staff showed up and found the place completely trashed, and they called the cops right away because they were very concerned when they saw the notes, because the notes claimed responsibility for Martin Brown's murder. The notes were full of poor grammar, misspelled words, and they were written in very childlike handwriting. The notes said, We did murder Martin Brown. Fuck off, you bastard. I murder so that I may come back. Fuck off, we murder. Watch out, Fanny, and the F slur. And the last one was hard to read. I'll give it a try. You are micey because we murdered Martin. Go brown, you beat. Look out, there are murders about by Fanny and old F slur, you screws. Now, police dismissed the incident and the letters because nothing was stolen from the nursery and because Martin Brown's death was ruled an accident, not a murder. So they just chalked it up to being a childish prank. A few days later on May 29th, Mary and Norma went to the Browns family home and spoke to Martin's mother when she opened the door because they wanted to see how she was doing. Mary looks at this grieving mother and asks if she can see Martin. And when June, Martin's mother, told her, no, sweetie, you can't see him. He's dead. Mary said to June, oh, I know. I want to see him in his coffin. And she just stood there smiling. June was so incredibly shocked that she just shut the door in Mary's face. How is this not the script of a horror movie? (sighs) On July 31st, 1968, three-year-old Brian Howe was last seen playing with his dog, his siblings, and Mary and Norma. Around dinner time, Brian's parents called for him, but he didn't come. So they started looking for him. It wasn't long before word spread that Brian couldn't be found, and a search party was formed and started looking for him everywhere in town. And the search party included Mary and Norma, who were very excited to be helping and looking for this little boy. Singing, dancing, skipping, having a great time. After a few hours passed and Brian still wasn't found, police were called and they searched for Brian well into the night. And at 11.10 p.m., three-year-old Brian's body was discovered in between two large concrete blocks in an area called Tin Lizzie, a section of waste ground. And he was covered in grass clumps and weeds. Brian's death was clearly a homicide. He had scratches and bruises around his neck from where he was strangled. There was scratches on his face and blood coming from his mouth. And there were a pair of broken scissors by his feet. 
The postmortem exam concluded that his cause of death was strangulation. The killer had squeezed Brian's nostrils shut with one hand while strangling him with the other. There were several puncture wounds to his legs, chunks of his hair were cut, and his genitals had been partially mutilated postmortem. There was also a crude attempt at carving the letter M into the boy's stomach. M for Mary, perhaps? There were also gray and maroon fibers found on Brian, which were thought to have been transferred from the killer to the boy's body during the attack. Investigators also concluded that there was not a lot of force used. And just by looking at the way that that M looked that was carved into the body, they concluded that the killer was most likely a child. And now for the manhunt. Over 100 detectives came to town to investigate Brian Howe's murder. And 1,200 children were interviewed over the next couple of days, including Mary and Norma. And several children informed investigators that they saw Mary and Norma playing with Brian the day that he died. Both girls, while being interviewed, were evasive, and they kept changing their stories and contradicting themselves. So investigators over the next couple of days ended up questioning both of the girls multiple times. The second time the girls were questioned, Mary had new information. Information suddenly. This time she said she'd seen an eight year old boy playing with Brian and that she saw him hit Brian. And she also said she saw that eight year old boy covered in grass like he was rolling in a field. And Mary said that she saw this boy with a small pair of scissors and she blurted out to the investigators I saw him trying to cut a cat's tail off with the scissors, but something was wrong with them. One leg was broken or bent talking about the scissors. Right then, the cop was like, this girl's the killer because no one knew about the scissors. That was information that was never released. Got her. Plus, the eight-year-old boy that she named was actually at the airport that day with his family, so he had a solid alibi. So Mary was already looking super sketch because she's lying. And on top of that, in every interview, she just kept on smiling and laughing. On August 4th, Norma's parents called the police and said that Norma knew details about Brian's killing and that she wanted to confess. So investigators questioned Norma again, and this time... Norma told the investigators that Mary had taken her to the location where Brian was found and showed her the body. She said when they got there, Mary demonstrated how she strangled Brian by strangling his throat and pushing up on his lungs because, quote... That's how you kill someone. Then she said Mary ran her fingers over his purple lips and said that she had enjoyed strangling him. And she said Mary had told her that she had carved into Brian's stomach with a razor blade and she showed Norma where she stashed the razor blade in the tall grass. So investigators asked Norma to take them to where Mary had stashed the razor blade. And when they got there, Norma lifted up some grass and boom, there was a razor blade right there that the police had missed. Oh, shit. So then cops go to Mary's house and they confront her with this new information. And Mary got super pissed and defensive. And Mary told the detectives, you're trying to brainwash me. I'll get a solicitor to get me out of this. Again, 11 years old. Can you imagine an 11 year old like yelling at the cops like, I'm going to get a lawyer. (laughs) And when the cops told Mary that Norma was the one that had led them to the razor blade, Mary threatened Norma's life right there in front of the cops. Then, Norma was brought in to write a full statement. This time in the written statement, Norma says she was there when Mary was strangling Brian. Norma said that Mary started to go all funny and then pushed Brian down to the ground and started strangling him. And then she told Norma, my hands are getting thick, you take over. But Norma was like, fuck this, and just got up and ran home, leaving Mary alone with Brian. Lots of different versions of the story coming out of these two. The gray and maroon fibers that were found on Brian's clothes were compared to articles of clothing from Mary and Norma's closets, and the gray fibers were matched to one of Mary's dresses, and the maroon fibers were matched to one of Norma's skirts. Brian Howe's funeral was August 7th, and an investigator, DCI Dobson, went to the funeral to go look for evidence and suspicious faces. And I guess the girls hadn't been arrested yet because they're so young, and there wasn't definitive evidence of which one killed Brian. Who was really there? Did they both do it? Are they just trying to pin things on each other? You know? But DCI Dobson saw Mary there standing right in front of the house house as they were bringing Brian's coffin out of the front door to start the procession. And she was just standing there watching and laughing and rubbing her hands together. (laughs) Mm Mm-mm. 
And Dobson saw this and was like, oh my God, I've got to arrest her right now. She'll do another one. So he made the decision to arrest both girls that afternoon. Mary sat down and wrote her entire statement, which claimed that she was with Brian when he was killed, but she blamed everything on Norma. DCI Dobson had closely examined the postmortem exam from Martin Brown's death, and he quickly suspected that Mary and Norma were involved in his death as well. So he told Mary this. He was like, listen, kid, I think you and Norma were involved in this kid's death too, and I think that you vandalized the nursery and you left those notes. And Mary admitted it. But again, she pinned everything on Norma. Norma killed Martin. It was Norma's idea to break into the nursery, and Norma wrote the notes. Investigators went to the girls' school so that they could get handwriting samples to compare to the notes left at the nursery. And after analyzing the handwriting, it appeared that both girls had written the letters. Like Mary would write a few words, and then Norma would write a few words, and then back and forth. So after that, they were confident that both girls were involved in both killings. Also in one of Mary's school books, they found a story that Mary had written that said, quote, There are crowds of people outside an old house. I asked what was the matter. There has been a boy that has laid down and died, end quote. Then underneath that story, Mary had drawn a picture of Martin Brown's body on the ground in the position that he was found in. And she drew the workman running to help. And she drew a little pill bottle next to Martin's body and labeled it tablet. The cops were like, oh shit. Because again, nobody knew about the pill bottle. That was another piece of evidence that was never released to the public. So both Mary and Norma were charged with the murders of Brian Howe and Martin Brown. When they were arrested, Mary said, that's all right by me. But Norma burst into tears and yelled, I never, I'll pay you back for this. The girls both underwent psychological evaluations and Norma's revealed that she was intellectually delayed and submissive, while Mary was revealed to be bright, cunning, and prone to sudden mood swings. The psychiatrists also said they believe that Mary suffered from psychopathic personality disorder. The trial for the murders of Brian Howe and Martin Brown started on December 5th, 1968. Both girls pled not guilty and they each had their own attorneys. Prosecution stated that while Mary was the more dominant one, despite being the younger of the two, both girls knew what they were doing and knew what would happen. In the court of public opinion, most people believed that Mary was guilty. And Mary's mom, Betty, did not help with that. Like, she was acting pretty erratic in the courtroom. Like, super over-the-top dramatic, loudly sobbing, interrupting court proceedings, getting up and storming out of the courtroom suddenly, and then would just walk right back in. It was super odd, and it seemed to everyone like she wanted all the attention on her. Like, I can't believe this is happening to me! When Mary was on the stand, she had blank expressions, showed no remorse, no emotions. She was very quick and very sharp, and she was easily able to respond to the lawyer's questions, and she would cut back with witty remarks. She just didn't seem like a little kid. She didn't act how everyone expected a little kid on the stand would act, and she just kind of seemed guilty. But Norma, people were torn on that one. She had a much more normal and sympathetic family. When Norma was on the stand, she was childlike, she was shaking, she was nervous, she was crying. She acted like everyone expected a child on the stand would act. At the end of the nine-day trial, the verdict came in after three hours and 25 minutes. Norma Bell was acquitted on all charges on the grounds that she was manipulated by Mary into doing the things that she did. They believed Norma didn't understand what she was doing because she was simple-minded. Mary Bell was cleared of murder, but she was charged with manslaughter of the two boys. It was reduced on the grounds of diminished responsibility and because Mary showed signs of psychopathy. When the verdict was read, Norma clapped her hands in excitement, but Mary burst into tears. The judge stated that Mary was an incredible danger to other children and was ordered to be detained at Her Majesty's pleasure, which I guess just means indefinitely. We hold you until we feel like we can let you go. Now Mary Bell was officially Britain's youngest female killer and still holds that title to this day. So no one really knew what to do with her. <laughs> they weren't used to locking up 11-year-old girls. You couldn't just throw her in a regular prison. Mental hospitals were not equipped to deal with her. They couldn't put her in a home for troubled children because she was a danger to the other children in the home. So Mary was sent to the Red Bank Secure Unit 
which was an institution for young offenders. So it was pretty much a reform school, but it was an all-boys reform school, and they actually decided to change it to a co-ed reform school just to accommodate Mary, which made her the only female inmate amongst 24 male inmates. Betty, Mary's mother, visited her frequently, and Mary was always happy and tearful to see her mother in the moment, but as soon as Betty left, Mary would act out, become aggressive, and seem disturbed. And Betty freaking made a bunch of money off of her daughter by selling letters and poems and pictures of Mary in her underwear to the tabloids. She did a bunch of tabloid interviews. She encouraged Mary to write home often, but make sure it's something good that I can sell to the tabloids. And because of Betty's little scheme, Mary ended up getting 50,000 pounds for a story that they sold to the tabloids about the little boys that she murdered. That's fucked up. Mary has always blamed her mother, Betty, for how she turned out. Mary even sent her mother a letter telling her this and asked her to go to the police and confess to say Mary's behavior was all Betty's fault so that Betty would be locked up and Mary would be free. In an interview, Betty was asked if she thought Mary was innocent. And Betty responded, no, no, I don't think she's innocent. And they asked her, well, what happened in her life that made her do the things that she did? And Betty said, well, maybe it's because me and my husband argue sometimes. Or maybe it's because I was under so much stress. Betty, that's it. It's because you were stressed. I think you left out a little bit about Mary's childhood that could have contributed to her behavior. Mary stated that starting at the age of 13, she was sexually abused by a staff member and several inmates at Red Bank, but her claims were dismissed because she was considered unreliable, but there was a staffing change shortly after that. At 16, she was transferred to a secure wing of the HM prison style in Cheshire, where she unsuccessfully applied for parole. And then in 1976, Mary was transferred again to Moore Court Open Prison, which was much lower security, much less supervision. They're often not locked up in cells and they can leave campus for jobs. So Mary ended up taking a secretarial course. In September 1977, Mary and another inmate actually briefly escaped and they picked up a couple of dudes in Blackpool and just hung out with them in a hotel for a couple of days because Mary wanted to lose her virginity. After a few days, they were found and returned, and Mary was punished with 28 days with no privileges. In November 1979, Mary worked as a secretary and also worked at a cafe, supervised to prepare her for entering back into the real world. And in May 1980, at the age of 23, Mary Bell was released after 11 and a half years in custody. She was granted anonymity and a new name so that she could start a new life. Four years later, on May 25th, 1984, on the 16th anniversary of Martin Brown's death, Mary had a daughter who would be her only child. The daughter was also granted anonymity until her 18th birthday, and her daughter didn't actually know anything about her past until 1998 when she was 14 when a couple of reporters tracked down Mary's location. And they tracked them down to a resort town on the Sussex coast and camped out in front of their house, and Mary and her daughter had to leave the house covered in bed sheets to go anywhere. Undercover officers ended up removing them and bringing them to a safe house, and then the two were relocated and the daughter was given lifelong anonymity. When Mary was 51 years old, she became a grandmother and the grandbaby was granted anonymity. And Mary Bell is still out there somewhere in the UK, age 65 at the time of recording this video, under a different name. We don't know who she is or where she is. It's so crazy that she was a convicted killer, served her sentence, and then got out at the age of 23 and had a full life after that. And that is the story of Mary Bell, the youngest female killer in Britain. What do you guys think? Do you think Mary was born evil? Or do you think she just had an incredibly terrible childhood that caused her to do the things she did? Mary later stated that at the time of the killings, she did not understand the permanence of death. But do you think she knew what she was doing was wrong? Do you think she just grew out of it? Do you think her institutionalization worked? Like she was just rehabilitated? Or do you think she should have got a life sentence? Do you think she should have been given anonymity? I have a lot of questions. 
Personally, I just cannot believe that her mother, Betty, never saw the inside of a jail cell. And the fact that she made money off of the kids that Mary killed. It's so fucked up. Like, I don't even care if you think Betty was responsible for the kids Mary killed or not. But at the very least, I can't believe she didn't get locked up for, like, abusing Mary. She gave her to her clients to be molested. She drugged her. She poisoned her. She abused her physically and emotionally. I can't, I just can't believe it. And I can't believe Mary didn't get it taken away from her. It just... It blows my mind. Fuck you, Betty. Betty is not in the running for mother of the year. I'll tell you that much. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Not everyone feels that Mary should have gotten lifelong anonymity. Martin Brown's mother, June, once stated, quote, It's all about her and how she has to be protected. As victims, we aren't given the same rights as killers. End quote. Rest in peace to Martin Brown and Brian Howe. They were so young, sweet, innocent little victims that didn't even get to start their lives. And it's just awful. Be sure to leave your thoughts in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe because I will be back next week with a new episode of Cleaning and Crime. Thanks again for watching. Bye-bye.